It's great to be here at Tulane University. I want to thank Walter Isaacson and Cheryl um, uh, Landrew for inviting us, Maureen and I, uh, to be here and be with you. Uh, we'll try to have some time for some microphones. And we're, I'm friends with Maureen. I, like all of you, admire her work so much. She's always my favorite person to read. Um, but we're going to have a fun talk, a conversation just about journalism, history, and perhaps where we're at now in 2024. Um, so if you don't mind, Maureen, I'll start off. I was always wondering at, with you, um, was there a moment as a writer where you, re I know you, you know, the Catholic University, and I know the story of your parents and happy St. Patrick's Days on our way here. But when was it really you felt the um, like kinetic about writing, like the putting the words together started feeling electric for you? Mm, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, Hmm, that's a good question. I think it was more, um, my ambition is always more sideways. Like I'll see someone doing something and I'll think, well, I can do that. You know, so I didn't have a firm grasp that I wanted to be a writer. And in the world back then, you know, it's weird. My mom in uh, the 20s applied when she was 18 to be a writer at the Washington Post. She had a family friend, a grizzled editor there. And he said to her, this is no place for young ladies. <laughs> and so she never got to be a reporter. And I didn't really have that in mind. I, in the world of those days, I thought I'd end up as a legal secretary or I was working after college at the Washington Hilton Tennis and Swim Club, hiring and firing lifeguards and uh, tennis instructors and wearing a tennis dress to work every day. And finally, my family had an intervention, and they said, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're one of the only people in our family to get to college, and we're expecting more. <laughs> so my brother had a friend who was the sports editor of the Washington Star, now defunct, and uh, we met him in a bar, and he said, how fast do you type, which was the question women got in those days. And I said, 60 minutes, you know. I mean, 60, uh, whatever. And uh, sorry, I have a pollen bomb, so I'm a little out of it. And uh, I said, can I start after tennis season? And mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, you're fired. <laughs> yeah, <right>. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to grovel back. And I was a clerk at the Star for two and a half years. And you know, we, it was before computers, so the reporters would call in and uh, they'd call in from the Watergate trial, and uh, you would type up their stories and with carbon paper, and uh, you know, it's another world. And so I gradually looked around and thought, I can do that, <laughs> you know? So it was a slow, arduous climb. Was there a byline that you were attracted to? You would read an article by a particular writer, uh, Scotty Reston or somebody that you just said, wow, that's how you do it, the craft of it. You, you, you do a, an article, a news article, that it's a perfect example of uses your palate. Well, we had the great Mary McGorry at the Star who was on Nixon's enemies list and she had gone to Boston Latin and she wrote, you know, I don't even, I think she wrote with a pen, but it felt like a quilled pen because she wrote the most perfect sentences with a Latinate structure and the sentences were gorgeous. And of course, I, I loved Russell Baker at the Times who also wrote in that beautiful formal way, but funny, he was really funny. And your transition from um, doing um, straight news or writing, writing articles, and then the ability to be the, the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist that you are. Um, you have to be incendiary sometimes as a columnist. Uh, was that era of Watergate, were you watching writers like, you know, what, what's Tom Wolf doing with the new journalism? What's Joan Didion doing? What's Hunter Thompson doing? Were you learning, collecting ways that when you broke out of you know, working straight for the newspaper and got your own voice that you, you had learned some tricks to the trade? Well, when I was at the Star, funnily enough, people like Gloria Borger were there with me and they would take me out to train me. 
And then they would send me out, you know, if a car flipped over on prom night and three kids got killed, they'd send me out to the suburbs to interview the parents. And I couldn't, I, I couldn't do it. I would just sit in my car and put my head on the wheel and think if I were their parent, I wouldn't want to talk to a reporter, so why should they want to talk to me? And, uh, you know, I'd start to drive away, and then I'd go back, and I'd knock on the door, but I'd be glad if they weren't home. But finally, I realized if I was going to be in this profession, I was being paid to do this. So I had to learn how to have a braver persona, the way Beyonce has Sasha Fierce, um, where maybe you're not like that. Maybe you're shy and introverted, but you, you have to do that in order to do the job. And so then later, that kicked in with a column, because when I first got the column, um, you know, I, my skin was breaking out, my hair was falling out, I was coming home and curling up on the floor in a ball and thinking, I just, you know, I can't do this, it's, it's too tough. And uh, one night, one Friday night, I walked past the mirror in my house, and I had clear still smeared on my face, and I was kind of eating a chicken leg and looking horrible, and I thought, I bet William Sapphire's having a better <laughs> Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, again, so I actually went to Hal Raines, my boss, and I said, I just don't think I'm cut out for that. And he was like, fine, I'll send you back to the Metro desk. And I had been a Metro reporter for 20 years, and, and I didn't want to do that. So again, I just had to put my head down and think, I've got to figure out how to do this and move forward. But that was a Sasha fiercer thing, because uh, my family would just laugh at the idea that I, I was critiquing people from this perch at the New York Times because they knew how shy I was. So then I was in this job that was like the godfather, like yeah. they'd take one of ours, I'd take two of theirs, we'd go to the mattresses, and my family was just like, what the hell is Maureen doing? You know, she can't handle this. But um, I don't know, Hal said, I, eventually, I developed the nerves of a riverboat gambler, but I, I don't think that's true. I think it's just as hard now. We're Bill Marine talking about presidents some, and I wanted to ask you about John F. Kennedy, but then get into the presidents that you've written about more. But you did do an essay about Kennedy, we forget, was a journalist for a short spell, or professed Jack Kennedy that he wanted to write books. He wrote why England slept and uh, profiles and courage. But after World War II, he was covering UN conferences, Potsdam, and he, he had that kind of journalistic mind. Uh, did your family like John F. Kennedy? Was there a Catholic connection? And how do you reflect on Kennedy and the presidency and how he moved journalism into telecommunications realm with the presidential debates, the famous press conferences with Helen Thomas and the like? Um, yeah, in our house when I was growing up, we had two big pictures. One was the Mona Lisa, obviously not the original, and one was JFK. And I remember there was another picture of JFK and Jackie. At, we had a tiny little beach shack near Annapolis, and Jackie's eyes would follow you wherever you were in the room. So that's an early childhood memory. And. Um, you know, uh, my father was from Ireland, from Clare, and Ireland was very important to him. So, uh, you know, he was the president of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, and, you know, they had Jack Kennedy. I think they made him an honorary member, but um, he, my father, it wasn't even so much that he loved Jack Kennedy so much, but he got really angry when the Protestant bishops, you know, gave him a hard time and he had to go down and make that speech. Where was that, you know? Well, um, oh, the speech he made to justify, to say. Oh, he went to uh, Houston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Houston. Uh, he had to make a speech promising that the Pope would not be involved in US policy making. And my father was, you know, that there wouldn't be a tunnel to Rome from the White House. And my father was so angry that uh, he was expected to do that, that he became a more staunch Kennedy supporter. And I think that 
uh, Kennedy was not perfect, certainly. There are a lot of problems, and we don't know policy-wise what would have happened with Vietnam, but I think he brought a certain elan and inspiration and wit to the presidency that is sorely missing. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, have you, have you, um, do you ever keep a special eye for Catholics in politics? Um, Joe Biden is Catholic president. Do you see them as something going on with, and there are many of the White House staff that are Catholic. I mean, is I that pay more attention to the Supreme Court, which has so many Catholics, and not only Catholics, but extremely conservative Catholics. And, uh, you know, I think that's had a large influence in shaping policy and not in a good way. How do you, Pope Francis has been sick lately. Um, um, how do you feel his role in the modern world is? I mean, we're, we're dealing with Ukraine, we're dealing with Israel, Gaza, have the, have the Pope um, trying to deal with climate change. Do you, is this a, a Pope that's interest you a lot more than others in your life? I think he, again, he has Elon, and, you know, he was refreshing at first, but I've honestly just got to say I'm really disappointed in him in terms of bringing women along to equality in the church. I mean, the church just always reminds me of Saudi Arabia. I think when you're not using the hearts and brains and spirit of women to a full degree, um, it's never going to be a healthy place. I think that's how the church got warped and sick, because they weren't, women weren't full partners. Um, and, and, you know, in the Bible, Jesus is completely surrounded. Their women are his top advisors. He was not a sexist, but somewhere along the way, in the ninth century, some sexist pope cut us out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about, what, what about, um, um, we mentioned being Washington, Nixon, Watergate. What was the influence of the Woodward Bernstein phenomenon in journalism? How do you think that that moment of, of going after, rightfully, Nixon, he asked to resign? You, you have many journalism history classes start there. It's like a new era of journalism. Do you see it that way? Well, it's very interesting when you compare it to the current time because uh, Nixon had to resign when they found out he'd done something illegal. And now with Trump, it just makes him more popular every time he does anything illegal. So we're a long way from that. Have, has, have you done a reconsideration of Nixon in lieu of Trump? Um, I think, you know, this is just a personal comment, but my brothers were pages on Capitol Hill because my dad was a police detective who was in charge of security on Capitol Hill for the last 20 years of his career. And they used to deliver mail. Nixon was, uh, as vice president, he was the, uh, you know, he had an office in the Senate and it was, happened to be next to JFK's. So they would deliver mail to JFK and JFK would completely ignore them as though they weren't there. And then they would go next door to deliver to Nixon, and Nixon would be like, hi, Mike, how's your dad? How's your family? And I just always came away with the thought that Kennedy was so secure, he didn't need to charm people one by one. And Nixon was so insecure that he had to charm everyone, even the teenagers delivering his mail. Very, uh, that's a good point. I, 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 yeah, that's great. And I'm thinking, I'm going to skip over a little. I want to get to the 1990s because you had a great run in the 90s with the New York Times, Pulitzer Prize. Uh, and this is the age of Bill Clinton, uh, two-term president, and you have the Monica Lewinsky scandal in the, in the middle of it. Uh, but it was a great decade for you professionally. But how do you think uh, Bill Clinton now, from the age of Trump Biden, and you're looking back over over your life, how does Bill Clinton's presidency hold up in your mind? And how do you how do you, how do you think about him? Um, let's see. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, the trouble with being a journalist is your best day is often someone's worst day. But that's another thing you have to get used to. Um, 
my problem with the Clintons was I felt um, a little bit strangled in the sense that they had this uh, Faustian deal where if you wanted their progressive policies on women and uh, other things, you had to put up with his retrogressive actions with women. And to me, the whole uh, Bill and his girlfriend's thing I saw from a class lens. I'm working class. And they thought it was the higher class women around Bill and all the feminists thought it was okay for the women who told the truth about sleeping with him to be treated as collateral damage because they were in a different class. And so he would bring out Madeleine Albright and uh, Donna Shalala and Hillary and they would all support him and say he was telling the truth when obviously he wasn't. And I didn't like the idea that these women in a different class who he had actually dated and always had to admit later he did were smeared you know, by the Clintons and they sick private investigators on them. So I guess, you know, that was my, I never quite could get beyond that with them. Did you ever feel the power of his charm? Um, let me think. I did, you, you I, did an, I did an interview with him once and I was asking him about his Elvis imitation and <clears throat> um, you know, he was a very, you know, he was very glib and he seemed like he, he would be fun if you knew him, but, but I, ju I didn't, I just wasn't, I just didn't like being in that Faustian deal where to get the good stuff that the Clintons had to offer, the brainy stuff, the progressive stuff, you had to sign on to the bad stuff. I just didn't like that. Now, before Clinton, we, we had uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, Bush 41 as president, and um, you, you've, you have developed a bit of a personal r relationship with him. Tell us about that. Yeah, this is so strange. So I come from a family of maids, <laughs> and Bush 41 was raised with maids, and he went to school in Greenwich, Connecticut, in a limousine. And um, I, I think in another, in another era, I probably would have been his maid. And I think he had a hard time adjusting to me as the New York Times White House reporter. So, you know, he was expecting someone with a name like Clyde Farnsworth III that he could <laughs> drink martinis with and discuss the Atlantic Alliance. <laughs> and then I was, you know, following him around on the golf course and calling him goofy, and he didn't like it. But <laughs> here is where the weird part came in. So he was such a fundamentally decent man that he, well, at one point his pollster took me out for dinner and after a couple of drinks he said, we don't really see you as the New York Times White House reporter. And uh, I said, what do you mean? He goes, we see you more at the Chicago Tribune or, you know, the New York Daily News. And I said, you mean because I'm ethnic and working class and a woman? And he said, yes, <laughs> that's where we see you. And, uh, but Bush was such a fundamentally decent man that he overcame his qualms about me and treated me really fairly as a White House supporter because, you know, the Times hadn't had that many women in the job and it was scary. And he treated me with, like, uh, as uh, the title of John Meacham's biography, he, The Last Gentleman. He was a perfect gentleman, and we developed uh, this relationship over the years where he wrote me, he loved to write little notes, and we're not talking John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> they would just be these crazy little notes, and uh, you know, he would say, I like you, Maureen Dowd, don't tell anyone. 
<laughs> and uh, he would sign them con afecto, you know, Spanish for with affection. And he, but the notes, even though they were simple, were complex because when I covered his president's White House, I was extremely critical of the decision to go to Iraq. And I think, well, I know that his parents also did not think it was the right thing to do. So the father was torn, but he would write me and, um, you know, say, I can't believe I'm writing this when you're so hard on my son. But, um, you know, he'd joke, maybe I need to see a shrink because the Bushes were not into shrinks or introspection. And this strange relationship came to a pinnacle in 2006 when W was president. And he had to go, he didn't go to Kennebunkport very much, but he had to go for a wedding, a funeral, and a christening. So I, I went with the press entourage for W, and um, you know, I was a columnist, so the, all the reporters went out to dinner and they didn't take me, and I was sitting in my room alone, and Carl Rove calls, and he goes, the old man wants to see you. <laughs> and he goes, but he doesn't want his son to know. <laughs> So I'm thinking we're on this tiny little promontory on the Atlantic Ocean. There are two sets of Secret Service agents. There's W's and there's HW's. And I'm thinking, how is the father going to pull this off? But I realized that the idea appealed to him because he had been head of the CIA and he loved that job. Yeah. And he used to sign his notes, head spook. <laughs> and so I think he loved the idea of a clandestine meeting where his son, the president, wouldn't know about it. So he spent a couple days trying to figure out how to do it, but then Karl Rove called back and said he couldn't. he couldn't figure out how to elude his Secret Service agents or to have his Secret Service agents elude his, his son's Secret Service agents. But I kind of love the fact that he tried. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember when I started my career as a historian and you're writing books, the biggest invite you could get is to a Marine Dowd party in Georgetown. I mean, it's like everybody would crowd over there um, and did uh, Bush later came to visit you, right? Didn't he come to you, see you at 1.41, like, uh, hello? Did he ever come see you? No, I think that was the story the, you're thinking yeah. of when he wanted to. Wanted to, and he couldn't. But no, he but then I went down to have lunch with him a couple years later, and um, he was in a wheelchair then, and uh, I think... He was right on the verge of making his last parachute jump. And he said, did you come to see me because you think I'm dying? And I said, no, I want to go in the parachute jump. Let's, <laughs> let's do it, you know? So that you, you speak with 41 with affection, great affection. And uh, what about the son, as you mentioned, with um, 43 and the um, overreaction to the 9-11 tragedy going in Afghanistan and, but mainly the Iraq weapons of mass destruction and the like. Uh, what, what, what was 43, how did he interact with you? Um, he must have known your the, Yeah, the I, I do like. think 40, the story of 43 is a tragedy. My, my sister volunteered for his campaign and really thought he was gonna be a great president and my sister and I had lunch with Johnny Apple, the great New York Times political writer and food writer in Oracle, and we asked him if he thought W would be a good president, and Johnny said, yeah, I think he's gonna be a really popular president. And I think he actually would have been if he had surrounded himself with people his own age, his own choices. But his father thought if he put in his people um, that he would protect his son. But unfortunately, those people had their own agendas. So they put in Dick Cheney, who was very, um, his Secret Service code name was Backseat. 
and he was very uh, retiring, and so W thought he wouldn't be a threat to him, but then he brought in Rumsfeld, and Cheney and Rumsfeld had agendas about presidential power that went way back, and Rumsfeld had agenda about Iraq, and so I, I felt like W, because of his insecurity, he, he just, uh, was not surrounded with the right advisors. It's like those old movies where the prince's regents are nuts, you know? And uh, yeah, I think that he was not well served by them. And it's a, a very, very sad story. I think it's, you know, the worst foreign policy mistake in American history. Um, and you feel that, um, it, well, that's, uh, that's a powerful statement. Um, when we go back, uh, Maureen, to I was talking about parties at your house, because people may not know, I mean, everybody wanted to be there. How did that, I've always wondered, how did that tradition start? I, I only had a couple parties. So no, these were like, <clears throat> did you? They were so bad that they're legendary. Yes, um, yes, they were legendary. A friend of mine from the South said to me afterwards, from now on, small dinner parties, six to eight people. I mean, <laughs> there were actually, I think, babies conceived at those parties. They were crazy. Um, who was it? Larry King said to me, uh, you know, what is this, a dollhouse you're in? Because there were so many people. And, but it's only because I didn't know how to give parties. And I had one for Obama's inauguration and... Um, I forget, I had another, just a book party, but I'm, I'm, I've sworn off ever, ever doing it again because I'm so bad at it. Oh, no, those are great memories. But the, the tell me about uh, President Obama um, and how you see two-termer also, um, still important, popular, but which, what, what did we, what were the, what were the pluses of, of Barack and Michelle Obama and covering them and, and what are the disappointments? Um, well, when Obama was elected, as I say, I had this uh, party, and um, I, I was so kind of excited about the whole thing that, you know, just having our first black president, it just seemed amazing, and he was, I was thinking all these other countries would be so jealous when they saw our president come down the stairs of the plane. He was so elegant and smart. And, uh, you know, after this party, he's describing, I made all my house guests get up at five in the morning so we could go to the Lincoln Memorial. And we get over there and, and a security guard stopped us. And I said, where are you from? And he goes, I said, are you from the Park Service? He goes, no, DC police, no. Um, I said, well, Secret Service, no. And I said, well, where are you from? You're blocking us to see the Lincoln Memorial. And he goes, I'm Beyonce security. Because <laughs> she had been singing there the night before. And, uh, but I'm just saying, I was, I was really happy and I thought now, um, unlike with the older white presidents, I would, they would treat me, you know, that a young black president would treat me, you know, uh, like uh, with more equity or whatever, but it was not to be. He, uh, Obama was always calling and golfing with Tom Friedman and calling David Brooks to talk about Niebuhr. And um, so when he was running, uh, he, he wanted to get foreign policy experience. So we took a trip to Berlin and Paris and on the plane, he was gonna give each of the reporters a 10 minute interview. So he called me up and uh, I thought, yeah, this is, it's gonna be like JFK and Scotty Reston, <laughs> you know? We're gonna have this amazing president columnist relationship. And he turned and said to his aides, can you guys leave us? I thought, great, he's going to tell me some national security secrets, <laughs> <laughs> like Rest and, and JFK used to share. And uh, he looked at me with those brown eyes, and he goes, you know, 
you are really irritating. <laughs> and I'm like, you haven't even started in the White House yet, you know, and you're already irritated. And then he repeated it for good measure. But he, his whole thing was he wanted to be seen as cool. And my whole thing as a columnist is I'm kind of tweaking these guys to keep their ego in check. So I used to tweak him about the fact that, you know, in these primaries in uh, democratic states, whenever he was handed, you're always handed food and drink, and he would hold it for a second and then hand it off to his body aide, Reggie Love. And, uh, you know, he was so, I, I just said, he's so thin that, you know, he considers an Altoid a three-course meal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the guy's wedding ring was falling off. He was so skinny. But he didn't like that. And he said to me, you set the zeitgeist, and uh, I want the zeitgeist to be, you know, that I'm cool. And so, so we got off on a bad start, and it went downhill from there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, what about Donald Trump? You covered him. You knew him in New York world. You did early interviews with him. Tell us about um, his evolution or how he's uh, he, he descended into what he's become from when you first knew him and to now when he's the GOP nom likely nominee on starting July 15th. Yeah, I... Um I'm trying to think. I met Trump. I met, well, I first talked to Trump when Mikhail Gorbachev came to America in, I think it was 87. And uh, Trump um, was one of the businessmen invited in to talk to Mikhail Gorbachev. So I talked to Trump before he went to the meeting and he said, the Soviets are awful, you know, we can't deal with them, they're communists. And then I talked to him when he came out of the meeting, and he goes, the Soviets are great, we have to <laughs> deal with them, they're great. I said, what happened? He goes, well, they want to build a Trump Tower in Moscow. Yeah. So, I mean, the guy, um, the guy has always been basically the same, very transactional, you know, a crazy showman who likes to imitate. The way his personality formed, he was very deliberate about it. He used to hang out at Yankee Stadium, and he looked around at all the larger-than-life people who came to Yankee Stadium. I think even Cary Grant came sometimes, and uh, Steinbrenner and Roy Cohn, and he's like, I want to be larger-than-life. So he like patterned a swagger on all these people. There was a, the king of the limos in New York and the king of the furriers, and they all had this swagger. And he just developed his own swagger. And I, so after that, over the years, I would interview him. I'd do a lightning round, which was his favorite thing to do. And we would just talk about politics and cultural people. But in a million years, you know, I never, thought he would be president, because mostly he was obsessing like on movie stars or their love lives, or he, he didn't know anything about policy. But in 1999, uh, Roger Stone arranged a speech for him to test the waters to run in 2000. And we went down to Miami, and uh, Melania had been redone by a stylist to look like a candidate's girlfriend. She was the girlfriend at that point. And so she was wearing very classy Calvin Klein, you know, a skirt below the knee and very classy shoes and stuff. And she said it was a, she said she was adjusting <laughs> because it wasn't what she was used to wearing. And Donald, when he saw Trump, 2000 signs, he kind of jumped back. He was very nervous about the whole thing. Um, but he definitely got a taste for it. And then when he got on the debate stage and realized that his Don Rickles kind of uh, making people feel less than they are shtick would actually work and vanquish his rivals. He called Jeb Low Energy and Little Marco and just that insulting people would work because he didn't really 
know anything about the issues, you know, then he was off to the races. Well, yeah, I think that's right. And have you, uh, how would he, if you called him now or you saw him, how would he respond to you? Um, he got, I had a book come out mid-campaign in 2016, and he uh, didn't like that. And then I ran into Ivanka and Jared at a dinner in D.C., and they were talking about bringing deliverables to Saudi Arabia, which sent a chill down my spine to see Ivanka talking about deliver deliverables. But Jared uh, Kushner came up to me and he said, my father-in-law used to like you, but then you went crazy. <laughs> and I said, well, one of us went crazy. <laughs> and he said, my father-in-law will talk to you again if you uh, tweet two nice things and do a nice column. Oh, God. And I was like, no. But then Trump <laughs> did uh, tweet about me, and he said I was a crazy moronic dope who didn't know him. So, uh, yeah. That's where it stands. That's, that's where it stands. So, but if I called him tomorrow, I bet he would see me because he's an attention addict. And now, you know, he, he just reminds me of a heroin addict or something with a needle in his arm because now he is in a position to get all the attention in the world, you know, and that is what drives him. Um, we're going to open the mics. I'm going to ask one question, but please come up if you have a question, and I'll, um, I'll, I'll ask you my last one unless nobody comes to the mic. Um, the, uh, uh, Joe Biden and the 2024 campaign, where are we at? What's been your relationship with, with Senator Biden, Vice President Biden, President Biden, and how are you seeing things be, uh, being framed right now for 2024? Well, that's another long story yeah. because I kind of contributed to knocking him out of the race in 88. I broke the Neil Kinnock story and he was inadvertently, it wasn't him, it was his speechwriter, Peckadell, was putting Robert Kennedy stuff in his speeches, whole quotes, and he didn't know. And, uh, but then over the years, he, he, got to really like me and uh, would call me asking if he should run for president and stuff, and he thought we had this Irish bond. Um, but then uh, a year out from him getting elected, I just wrote a story. It was when Hunter was having an affair with his sister-in-law, and uh, the family was ostracizing Kathleen, Hunter's first wife, and I just wrote a very mild column saying, you know, if, if he was going to run, he had to get it together with the family. <laughs> little, little did I know how much worse it would get. But uh, he got angry because Hunter is the third rail. I mean, if you mention Hunter even in a mild way, uh, you know, you can get cut out of columnist briefings. <laughs> and, but you had an interesting thing about the, the reason through history when presidents decide not to run again, it's often the wife. And I think that has a lot to do with this time. It, it does have a lot. And I think we know now, with the, uh, we, this, the certainties are, and I want to grab the questions, are we've got Trump, we've got Biden, and these third party candidates that look like they're coming in. Do you have any um, thing about Robert Kennedy Jr.? How do you see what his, you know, Ross Perot got like 19% in 1992. Where do you see RFK Jr.? Could he be a seven points person, 10? Yeah, I don't know. You know, he, he said the other day he wants to make Aaron Rodgers his vice president. So, you know, journalists are always torn because you look at things as a citizen and as a journalist. And as a journalist, I really want to see the RFK Aaron Rodgers ticket. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll let, let's, oh, go, go, yes, sir, go ahead. I'd actually like to see him run with Jesse the Body Ventura, but in any event, All right. <laughs> um, thank you both very much. Uh, you indicated earlier that your father was an officer on Capitol Hill. So I would imagine that the events of January 6th struck a very personal chord with you. Uh, in that regard, and I offer this to both of you, 
uh, it doesn't seem that the events of that day uh, are top of mind for many Americans as, as we head toward this year's election. Do you guys have any insight as to why that is in this sort of post-factual America that we're in? Yep. Good. Well, so what's the key to the question? Sorry, about we Michigan. Quite hear you? No, I was just joking about. Oh, oh you talking about this with Michigan? No, no, no. Ah. Oh, no, no. What, we didn't quite hear the question. question. Oh, do you have any insight as to why the events of January 6 don't appear to be more I, top of mind for Americans? Gotcha. I would have thought personally, I got that all wrong. I thought January 6 was the end of Donald Trump. I thought it was game over when Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham and the rest threw down the gauntlet. I did know Trump was going to be perhaps a uh, still a bull carrying his own china shop around with him, that he would have some kind of potential third party mischief coming. But the fact that the Republican Party would give Trump the nomination, I was blindsided by that. And I still don't know why January 6th in the insurrection isn't the n number one, the saving of democracy, the number one issue of our time. Given that we just had a president who controlled the narrative by being too accessible, and we now have a president who controls the narrative by being inaccessible, how do you think the media can repair their relationship with either the politician class or the people uh, to move towards a point where, like you said, you know, Nixon was a get at him moment? How can we get those moments back? Um, so how do the journalists get more tough? Is that what you're asking? Tougher, yeah. Tougher. Marine, how does journalism, well, the New York Times has been, people have been talking that maybe they've been too tough on Biden lately. Yeah, you know, the thing is the Democrats always act like we're part of their team, and that's fundamentally not how journalism works. Journalism is about, we are watchdogs. We're not here to protect Democratic candidates who have flaws and to help paper that over. So they get mad at us if we write about Biden's age, but Biden's age is something that Americans are worried about. And you know, I first started working in Washington for the Times in um, 86, and that was right about the time when Reagan began receding from view, and none of us knew what was happening, who was running the country. Um, there was talk about the 25th Amendment, but it was a scary thing, and you know, I've written columns that I think Biden should just say he had a good presidency and take the win. But uh, you know, as Doug will tell you, once people have power, they're loath to give it up. Yeah, it's not a normal thing. Wait, thank you. Um, we're going to end by my, the one last point. Marine, you have been a national treasure. I say this. Reading your column has been mandatory for so long, and I hope that um, you understand what you mean to so many women and your voice for women's issues, and, and I mean that. And so the last framing for you is, is that you seem to have gotten along with Nancy Pelosi well. What are women women figures you've gotten to know and have developed a kindred, you know, a relationship with? I only, you know, I admire Nancy Pelosi so much only because covering Hillary Clinton all those years was so painful to watch because she could never figure out how to deal with the gender issue, you know? I, I still think she might have won the election if when Trump was lurking behind her in the debate if she had just turned around and said something super snappy about, get out of my space, you stalker, you know, I think she would have won. But she didn't want to because she, she's thinking, she overthought it all. Like, what would men think if I do that? I'll be seen as too aggressive. So she ran her first campaign as a man. Mark Penn told her literally to run as a man, and she did. And then the second one was all... Lena Dunham and Katy Perry, it was like a girl's slumber party, and it was jarring. Like, she didn't seem to know how to incorporate, you know, female power into her persona, and that's what I loved about Nancy Pelosi. She never gave it a thought. She was in four-inch stilettos. She was <laughs> click-clacking down the Capitol halls, and everyone knew you do not cross Nancy Pelosi. 
She was tougher than any guy. I had dinner the other night with John Boehner. He said she was the best speaker in American history. This is from a former speaker. Yeah, and I, I just love the fact that she didn't give it a thought. She could be feminine, she could be a mother, she could cut guys, are we allowed to say balls off? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it was just, she didn't think about it. And I, I, I just admired the way she wielded power as a woman. Very good. Maureen, thank you, and thank you all.